give a pastor a Bible and an audience, uh, there's a good chance you're going to hear a sermon. Um, and so I'm going to do some preaching this afternoon uh, because I can't help it. Um, and so that means if you have your Bible, feel free to pull it out and follow along. We'll be in several passages throughout the next half hour or so. Um, but it also means that my goal is not to impart information to you, uh, but so that the Spirit of God and the Word of God would transform each one of our hearts um, and bring us in line with what He is doing in the lives of the residents of both the Colony of Mercy and Barbara's Place. Open up with Jeremiah 8, 21 through 22. I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people. I mourn, horror has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? In her book, Trauma and Recovery, Judith Herman describes Sigmund Freud's early work with women who were suffering from what was then called hysteria. And a pattern quickly emerged as patient after patient described significant childhood trauma, most often sexual abuse, uh, leading Freud in one of his early papers to identify what he called premature sexual experience as the cause of hysteria. Within a year of writing that paper, however, he realized that if all of his patients were telling the truth, then sexual abuse of children was rampant, even within his, the respectable families that made up his own social circles. He knew that if his initial findings were correct, it was an indictment of his society as a whole that required fundamental changes. And so he proposed an alternative solution, the one that he eventually became famous for. He said that his hysterical patients weren't describing past traumatic events, but sexual fantasies and desires. That they hadn't been abused by the adults in their lives, but instead were plagued by a desire to be with those adults sexually, with the implication that even as small children, those desires were present. And intellectually, Christians have rightfully rejected these later views that Freud came to hold, but practically, we often adopt his reasoning and methods. Now, we in the church are now faced with the same problem that Freud was. Now, Allie went over some of the statistics earlier on the high percentage of people, especially among those whom we serve, who have experienced trauma. Uh, for me personally, a significant number of people that I've worked with over, tw over 20 years in ministry, both men and women in the local church and here at the colony, have experienced significant trauma, either as children, in adulthood, or both, to the point where, in my experience, the, the statistics that Ali quoted are actually underreported. And so if trauma really impacts the way that current studies, and I will argue today the Bible tell us that it does, we have to recognize it as an indictment of our society, both our American society at large and our individual churches and ministries that requires fundamental changes that we need to address. And it also means for each of us individually that we have to admit that we have had experiences that have shaped us for the worse in ways that we are often unwilling to reckon with. And so we do what Freud did. We shift the focus off the causes of trauma and put it onto those who have suffered trauma. At our worst, we victim blame, putting the responsibility on the victim rather than the perpetrator. But more often, we simply fault them for being unable to just get over it, according to our timetable. And this denial of the effects of suffering is itself a coping mechanism, an attempt to deal with the painful reality by avoiding it rather than addressing it. It's really no different than this painting by Edvard Munch. Uh, you might recognize the style. He's the one that did the, the, that painting, The Scream, where the guy's kind of in the Macaulay Culkin pose uh, from Home Alone. Um, but this is one, The Child and Death. Uh, Munch's mother died when he was six years old. His sister died a few years later. And so this is likely, in his adulthood, those early traumatic experiences re-emerging in his art. And yet this child, her response to the death of her mother is to turn away and cover her ears, as though the painful event does not exist if she can block her awareness of it. And many of us do exactly that when it comes to trauma and its impact. We turn away 
We stop up our ears, we distract ourselves with politics or theology, and we go on with life pretending as though the dead body in the room isn't actually there. The Bible, however, assumes trauma in a way that we are often uncomfortable with. A few months back, a colony resident who was new to reading the Bible for himself stood up at TNT and gave a testimony about being shocked by the Bible's content as he read through it. And he had not even made it through Genesis at that point. Um, and he was just mystified. Uh, he had grown up around church and been exposed to parts of the Bible, and yet for the first time he was discovering all the horrendous, horrific things that the Bible addresses. Uh, you, you could look, I took Allie's types of trauma from earlier uh, and just attached some, some Bible scenarios to them. And I'm not going to go through them for time's sake, but these are just off the top of my head. I didn't have to go searching through the Bible. I didn't spend hours leafing through trying to find uh, scenarios in the Bible that line up with our current understanding of trauma. This was just off the top of my head. The Bible assumes trauma. Megan Warner says, The biblical books are not in any sense trite or fragile. They come out of the experience of individuals and communities who have gone through the most painful and violent experiences that life can throw at human beings. They are written against a background of famines, wars, enslavement, political power struggles, natural disasters, forced migrations, and apparent betrayal and desertion by God. The irreverent tags that we sometimes attach to the Bible, nice, conservative, boring, and irrelevant, even when we do not mean to, for example, what image comes to your mind in response to the phrase Bible stories are mostly unwarranted and inaccurate. When understood against its own context, the Bible is none of these things. It has street cred. It understands suffering. And it understands suffering in a way that so many of us don't. Uh, there are significant cultural and societal reasons why when we talk about biblical wisdom in evangelical settings, we jump right to Proverbs and not to Ecclesiastes, Job, or Lamentations. Why we focus on the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan to the neglect of the wilderness wanderings, despite the fact that the wilderness wanderings occupy so much more of the biblical text. Why we rush to the victory of Easter Sunday without properly reckoning with the horror of Good Friday or the liminal space of Holy Saturday and why we reduce these Bible stories uh, to, to, to ones that can be told to children using pieces of flannel or animated vegetables. Our discomfort with the concept of trauma and our rush to see it as being at odds with biblical revelation and the gospel say much more about us than they say about the Bible or the gospel. I opened up with Jeremiah 8, 21 through 22, not because it contains words like brokenness, mourn, and horror, uh, which are exactly what we're talking about when we talk about trauma, but even more so because these verses, like so many others throughout the Old Testament prophetic books, lament a superficial solution to the brokenness of the people. The religious leaders of Jeremiah's day responded to brokenness much like the religious leaders of our day do. They saw a religious problem, and so they prescribed a religious solution. Come to the temple, offer your sacrifices, pray, tithe, worship, and if you do, then all will be well. God will be pleased. And yet just a couple of verses earlier, Jeremiah says, they have treated the brokenness of my dear people superficially, claiming peace, peace, where there, when there is no peace. Religious works do not change us or sanctify us any more than they justify us. We are far too broken for such a superficial fix. In Jeremiah 9, as God continues talking about the sin and the suffering of his people, uh, starting in verse 17 of Jeremiah 9, he says, This is what the Lord of armies says, Consider and summon the women who mourn. Send for the skillful women. Let them come quickly to raise a lament over us so that our eyes may overflow with tears, our eyelids be soaked with weeping. For a sound of lamentation is heard from Zion, how devastated we are. We are greatly ashamed, for we have abandoned the land. Our dwellings have been torn down. Now hear the word of the Lord, you women. Pay attention to the words from his mouth. Teach your daughters a lament and one another a dirge. Verse 
for death has climbed through our windows. It has entered our fortresses, cutting off children from the streets, young men from the squares. God speaks of eyes overflowing with tears and eyelids being soaked with weeping, uh, describing emotion that is beyond our physical capacity to bear. He describes the people as devastated and ashamed, two emotions commonly linked with trauma. He goes on to use the metaphor of death sneaking into our lives, cutting us off from our abilities to defend and cope and from the very rhythms of life, which is about uh, as good a description for the impact of trauma as you could come up with. This is God using the language of trauma and describing the effects of trauma several millennia before any psychologist began to use that language to describe what they were observing. In fact, the, the word trauma is a Greek loan word that appears in both the New Testament and the Septuagint. So if you've said the word trauma, you, you speak a word of Greek, uh, if no other words than that. Uh, and it appears in both the New Testament and the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was the version that the New Testament authors quote. It's used literally of physical wounds in the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, he went over to him and bandaged his wounds. That's the word trauma. But it's also used more metaphorically for existential, emotional, spiritual wounds. For example, in the Greek translation of Isaiah 6, uh, the whole head is hurt and the whole heart is sick. From the sole of the foot even to the head, no spot is uninjured. Wounds, that's the word trauma, welts and festering sores are not cleansed, bandaged, or soothed with oil. And so if trauma is assumed by Scripture, the question is how to address it. I think the Bible gives us both positive examples of what to do and negative examples of what not to do. And so we're going to look at those in the reverse order with the help of a couple of case studies from the biblical text. And the first one is the rape of Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, the, the story of the rape of Tamar actually begins in 2 Samuel 11 when David rapes Bathsheba. Uh, this isn't the time or the place to go into all the reasons why rape is the correct word for David's actions, uh, but a significant textual indicator is its relationship with the rape of Tamar just two chapters later. They are linked within the text, um, interrupted only by the interceding chapter of 2 Samuel 12, where Nathan, Nathan confronts David, leading to David's repentance, followed by the death of the child Bathsheba had conceived, and then later the birth of Solomon. And then we read in 2 Samuel 13, 1, Some time passed. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon is infatuated with Tamar the way that David had been infatuated with Bathsheba. He sees, he obsesses, he takes. He cooks up this elaborate plan wherein he, he feigns sickness and asks David to send Tamar to care for him. And when she comes to care for him, he demands that she sleep with him. And when she refuses, not entirely, but just insisting that he marry her first to save her disgrace, he rapes her. And at this point, he still could have saved her some disgrace by marrying her after the fact, but instead he turns on her. And verse 15 says that his hate for her was greater than his previous infatuation with her. She again pleads with him not to send her away because that will only increase her disgrace. But he refuses to listen and does it anyway. Now Tamar's initial response is a good, healthy, appropriate one. In verse 19, it says, Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long sleeve robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying out. She makes a very public display of mourning and calls out for help. Now, that's what crying out means. She wasn't weeping. She was screaming for help, making it known that she was raped, making a public statement that she had not committed fornication, uh, which was a necessary cultural act in order to retain her honor. Amnon had committed a grievous sin, one that he only kept compounding. He not only slept with his sister, he raped her. And he not only raped her, but then he refused to do the one thing that he could have done to make her somewhat whole. And according to the Mosaic law, he should have been put to death. And that makes the response of Absalom and David even more grievous. Second Samuel thirteen twenty, her brother Absalom said to her, 
Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. And in verse 22, Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. Absalom hears Tamar's cries of rape and responds in two ways. First, he tells her to be quiet, for Amnon is her brother. Absalom knows that if Tamar presses the point, if she insists on charging rape, then Amnon will be disgraced at best and executed at worst. And so Absalom silences her in order to save him. She is sacrificed that he might live. Amnon had victimized Tamar, but now Tamar is forced to protect Amnon. And notice that according to verse 22, Absalom not only insists that Tamar stay silent, but he remains silent as well. Tikva Frimer Kensky says Tamar is the victim of both brothers, first by Amnon's rape, then by Absalom's silencing. Nobody looks at her as a person. To Amnon, she was an object of lust and then hate. To Absalom, she is a crisis that has to be contained. Tamar's own feelings do not enter into their calculations. And to make matters worse, David responds very much the same way. Uh, our English translations, which are based on the Hebrew text, simply says in verse 21 that David was furious. Uh, but the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, as well as some Hebrew copies of 2 Samuel found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, elaborate a little more. Uh, the Septuagint, for example, says King David heard all these things and he was very angry. That's where most of our English translations end. But the Greek goes on and says, but he did not punish the spirit of Amnon, his son, because he loved him, because he was his firstborn. Given the context of this passage with David's own rape of Bathsheba occurring just two chapters earlier, it's not hard to see why David might sympathize with the perpetrator rather than the victim, why he might let Amnon go free just as he had gone free. But that impulse to side with the offender is there for all of us. Judith Herman writes that the reason we are hesitant to bear witness to the trauma of others is that the bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. And so David and Absalom both choose sides. They choose sides with Amnon, choosing to protect his well-being and his honor over and against Tamar's. Notice Absalom's second response. He tells her, don't take this thing to heart. He now minimizes what has happened, essentially telling her to just get over it. The only problem is that by not pressing the issue of rape, the assumption would have been that Tamar had slept with Amnon willingly bringing disgrace upon her rather than him. Because of that, she would not have been able to get married. She would never have had a family of her own. And so she had not just been raped. Her whole life had been stolen from her. And yet Absalom tells her to forget about it, to get over it, to not take it to heart. And what we need to grapple with is that these two responses are incredibly common within the church, and dare I say, even within this room. Too often we tell people to be quiet, to just stop talking about your trauma. Too often we tell them not to take it to heart, to just forget about it and move on, get over it. Like David and Absalom, we prioritize our own comfort over and against their healing. But look at what these responses do to Tamar. The Bible says that she lived as a desolate woman. That word desolate is from the Hebrew root shamam, which when used of a city means deserted, abandoned, or laid waste, and which when used of people often carries the connotation of being unmarried and childless. But in both cases, it is forced desolation imposed from the outside. Tamar isn't desolate because she had remained unmarried and childless, but because of why 
she had remained unmarried and childless. In fact, according to the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, the specific form of the verb used here in 2 Samuel carries the idea of being horrified. And horror is a trauma concept. The horror of what has happened, being raped by one brother, silenced by another, undefended by her father, robbed of any possible future, and abandoned by both her family and society, has left Tamar horrified and desolate. Or to use a term from a previous generation that maybe we might be more comfortable with, she's shell-shocked. And so to summarize the impact on Tamar, she's horrified or traumatized, she's shamed, she's silenced and disempowered, she's robbed of both her voice and her agency, She's invalidated. Amnon's feelings are the ones that matter, not hers. And she is abandoned by her family and her society. But before we move on, we need to note that Absalom's silence doesn't just traumatize Tamar, it traumatizes him too. Over the course of the next several chapters, we see that he stews silently for two years, then has Amnon murdered, then rebels against David and tries to steal the throne before ultimately dying in the rebellion. And the fact that chapter 14 mentions four children being born to him, three sons and a daughter, and yet only identifies the daughter by name, Tamar, seems to indicate how his sister's rape and his own response to it continued to haunt him. Tamar is robbed of her voice and her agency, and so she retreats inward because that's the only option she has culturally. Absalom eventually finds his voice and agency, but because he has not healed from the trauma, he lashes out in his anger and his grief with fatal consequences. The moral of the story is that ironically, the very thing we try to avoid by telling people to stop talking about their trauma and just get over it is the very thing we bring about. Walter Kaiser says suffering cannot adequately be dealt with by pretending that it does not exist. It will do no good to try to minimize it or talk it out of existence. It does exist, and it does hurt. Nor will it do any good to search for a sudden cure for its pain, as if but one, by swallowing a miracle pill of modern pharmacology, could remove at, move all at once the heavy weight it imposes. The most comforting news Scripture has for the sufferer is that where pain, grief, and hurt are, there is God. Instead of a panacea, our Lord offers his presence. One of the greatest promises in the Bible, which speaks to all our fears, is bound up in the very name of our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. By ignoring the reality of the wounds that we experience, we actually make ourselves more spiritual than God himself, who not only enters our pain through the incarnation, but also carries our pain to the cross. And who, when faced with the first sin by Adam in the garden, responds not by immediately asking, what have you done, but by first asking, where are you and who told you? And so that's the way we should not respond to trauma. The way we should respond, what the bomb of Gilead is, the answer to Jeremiah's question, of course, there is a bomb in Gilead. And I do want to be clear that people who have experienced trauma need the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, anyone in our program or outside, ultimate healing comes through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Kaiser noted, the answer to trauma and pain that we experience is the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And the way that we come to encounter that promise of the incarnate word is through the written word of the biblical text. Carla Grosch Miller says, when a community experiences senseless violence, betrayal, or natural disaster, when the rug is pulled out and unnamed assumptions are shattered, when only the night sky is big enough to hold the enveloping darkness, biblical texts prove a trustworthy resource to navigate the long journey of wilderness wandering. Like stars in that darkness, the cross of Christ, the argument of Job, the tears of Jeremiah, the curses of the psalmist, and the wisdom of Paul illumine the path towards home. And so we do believe, I believe, 
uh, that the gospel, the word of God, is the answer. But knowing what the right medicine is, is really only half the battle. I woke up with a headache this morning, and by the time it was, it was time to start coming over here for the morning session, it had gotten worse, not better, and so I took Advil Liquid Gels. It's my preferred headache medication. And now the only way that helps me is if I apply them the right way. If I break open those liquid gels and take the liquid and rub them on my temples where I have a headache, it's not going to take the headache away. If I try to get them into my body through any other orifice than my mouth, it's not only not going to work, it's going to cause further problems. The only way that that medicine is going to work to cure my headache is if I swallow them so they can be broken up by my stomach acid and absorbed into my bloodstream through my stomach lining. Any other way, it's not going to work. And so by offering trauma education and trauma counseling at the Colony and Barber's Place, we are not saying that some psychological method is the answer to the problems that our residents are facing. Instead, we are saying that we are so confident that Jesus is the answer, that he is the bomb of Gilead that our residents so desperately need, that we want to apply that cure in the most effective way possible, directly onto the wounds that need healing. And so I want to address quickly some trauma-informed principles and the Christian beliefs that undergird them, and we're going to go through them quickly because Megan will touch on them more fully in a little bit, and then look at one more case study of those principles in action. And so applying the bomb of Gilead, uh, first we need compassion due to a view of sin not only as a willful action, but also as an outside invading force that holds us captive. One of the most formative Bible verses for me in ministry. It's one that I've actually talked about at Staff Enrichment a few years back. This is Matthew 9, 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus knew better than anyone that the people were sheep without a shepherd because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And yet he still has compassion on them because he understood that they were victims of sin and not just perpetrators of sin. Original sin, all of our total depravity, all of our doctrines surrounding sin tell us that we are all sinners, but also that we are all victims of other people's sin, as well as victims of the invading force of sin itself. Secondly, we need a non-reactive, non-anxious non-judgmental presence that recognizes both God's sovereignty and patience and my own flaws and failings. We want to be non-reactive and non-judgmental because two of the emotions most commonly linked to trauma are fear and shame. And even when people share horrific things, when we react in a horrified way, we confirm for them that they're different that they made a mistake opening up about it, and they just need to shove it right back down. We want to be non-anxious because change is not instantaneous, especially when dealing with trauma. We don't want them to rush from a negative flesh response to a positive flesh response, but rather to engage the spirit who will heal them from the inside out. We need to remember that God is not obligated to change people according to our timetable. Thirdly, we want to empower them, restore voice and choice in line with the person bearing God's image and possessing his spirit. Two things that trauma robs are, are those two things, voice and choice. It makes it so that people can't speak up and they can't make decisions. And so we want to restore those things by helping them learn to speak for themselves and to make their own decisions. We don't want to do things for them because doing things for them re-traumatizes them, re them rather than helping them. Because even when it's done out of good motives, we are nonetheless repeating the trauma cycle of being a person in authority in their life who knows better than they do what they need. Fourthly, we need lament, which demands that truth be told in its entirety. Truth about circumstances, about the impact on the sufferer, and about God. Sung Chan Ra says, true reconciliation, justice, and shalom require a remembering of suffering 
an unearthing of a shameful history, and a willingness to enter into lament. Lament calls for an authentic encounter with the truth. And finally, they need hope that they can heal, grow, and change, and reconnect to life. The more hopeless they are, the more hopeless they seem to us, the more hopeful we need to be. Uh, the more hopeful we need to be, not in a Pollyanna-ish sort of hope, but because we know the power of God. We know the power of the Word of God, that it does not return void. We know the power of the Holy Spirit. Eugene Peterson says the task of pastoral work is to comfort without in any way avoiding the human realities of guilt or denying the divine realities of judgment. There is no better place for learning how to do that than in lamentations. In the midst of suffering, lamentations keeps attention on the God who loves his people so that the judgment does not become impersonal nor the guilt of the people neurotic, nor the misfortune merely general. It pays attention to the exact ways in which suffering takes place. It takes with absolute seriousness the feelings that follow in the wake of judgment. And then it shapes those sufferings and feelings into forms of response to God. Pain thus becomes accessible to compassion. And so we're going to look really quickly at a case study of lamentations, walking through these things that Peterson says. Um, I've preached lamentations down at the Colony Chapel, um, and it does provide us a framework for biblically dealing with trauma through these things, and it, it mirrors a lot of what we do in trauma work at the Colony and Barber's Place. Uh, so the first, the exact ways suffering takes place. Uh, Lamentations 1-3, Judah has gone into exile following affliction and harsh slavery. She lives among the nations but finds no place to rest. All her pursuers have overtaken her in narrow places. Verse 5 of chapter 1, her adversaries have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease for the Lord has made her suffer because of her many transgressions. Her children have gone away as captives before the adversary. Uh, Jeremiah deals with the feelings that follow those events. Verse 16 of chapter 1, I weep because of these things. My eyes flow with tears, for there is no one nearby to comfort me, no one to keep me alive. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed. In verse 11 of chapter 2, my eyes are worn out from weeping. I am churning within. My heart is poured out in grief because of the destruction of my dear people because infants and nursing babies faint in the streets of the sea. It models forms of response to God. Verse 20 of chapter 1, Lord, see how I am in distress. I am churning within. My heart is broken, for I have been very rebellious. Outside, the sword takes the children. Inside, there is death. And chapter 2, verse 19, Arise, cry out in the night from the first watch of the night. Pour out your heart like water before the Lord's presence. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who are fainting from hunger at the head of every street. And then it makes pain accessible to compassion. Famous passage in chapter 3, verses 22 through 24 that Ali already referenced. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. In verses 31 through 33 of chapter 3, For the Lord will not reject us forever. Even if he causes suffering, he will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love. For he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. Remaining silent about or ignoring the trauma and the pain it has caused is actually counterproductive to bringing about our desired results. Notice that other than this last slide with the pain accessible to compassion, every other verse from Lamentations that I used was from the first two chapters. Jeremiah does not come to the realization that God's mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness is great by accident or in spite of Lamentations 1 through the first, through the half, uh, midway through chapter 3. He comes to that realization because of the, the lament of the first two and a half chapters. It was only because he was detailed and truthful about his circumstances 
as well as the feelings and the survival responses that they caused, that he could then also be truthful about God. We cannot believe truth about God while living in darkness or falsehood about the rest of our lives. We can intellectually know things about God, but we cannot believe truth about God with, while living in falsehood or darkness about the rest of our lives. And we, as American evangelicals, tend to read the Bible for the finished, proce- the finished product and not for the process. And in doing so, we cheat ourselves out of the very process that will bring about the desired result. Now, we cannot take Lamentations 3, verses 23 through 24, the result of Jeremiah's painstaking work of lament and inner work, embroider it on a pillow, memorize it, think we've applied it to our lives. Instead, we will discover that God's mercies are new every morning and that his faithfulness is great as we undergo that same painstaking work of lament and inner work. Sonia Waters, in her book, Addiction and Pastoral Care, says, Resurrection is the stubborn promise that our suffering matters and the subversive hope that new life can arise from death. But this promise and hope must indeed be stubborn and subversive, not an anxious desire to ignore the suffering that remains. So to close, I just want to contrast these two paintings, uh, Munch's The Child and Death, which I showed earlier, and Ivan Kramsky's Christ in the Wilderness. As I mentioned earlier, many of us are where the girl in the painting is, in denial of the dead body in the room and trying to avoid seeing it hearing talk of it, thinking about it, uh, and, and hoping that if we keep knowledge of it out of our senses, it just won't exist. And in that case, the hope of the resurrection is not really hope, because it doesn't speak to reality. It's at best a wish dream, and at worst a distraction. But what I love about Christ in the wilderness, and enough that there's a copy of it hanging in my office, is that it shows Christ not avoiding our suffering, but leaning into it. He doesn't deny or minimize or ignore the suffering that we experience or his own that he experienced during his earthly life. And that is part of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the first page of scripture to the last, God is a God who brings everything out of nothing order out of chaos, and life out of death. And so when we minimize or ignore or try and forget about the nothingness, the chaos, and the death that we or the people we minister to so often experience, we rob ourselves and those people that we care for from truly experiencing Christ's life.